Hello and welcome to the Rural Doctors Program. I'm Jerry Gannon. Thanks for joining us. In this broadcast, we're going to take another look at travel medicine, including vaccines and global trouble spots. Later in the program, we'll also talk to plastic and reconstructive surgeon Dr. Mark Strawn about the worrying trend in cosmetic surgery tourism. But firstly, we join Dr. Olga Ward as she talks to travel medicine specialist Dr. David Rutherford. David, welcome to the program. Thanks, Olga. David, I think our patients quite often go off for an adventure these days. They don't just go to Europe for three weeks or five weeks or whatever. They actually go trekking around Nepal or mm. trekking through the jungle or something. Um, can you tell us a little bit about things like vaccinations, particularly because that's what they consult the GP about? Mm. Uh, yeah, I guess it is true that people are, uh, you know, got access to go many places these days and for longer time periods as well. Um, I guess uh, um, the way we try and uh, approach or the way I'd advise you try and approach um, how to break, there are so many vaccines you have to really break break it down into um, fitting in with the individual um, traveller themselves and trying to look very closely at the itinerary, especially accommodation activities when they're away. Mm -hmm. um, so um, for instance the common one for GPs is patients who are going to Bali Mm. And most of the time they're going to be sitting in a reasonably mm. malaria-free resort yeah. that might still have yeah. dengue. Yeah. Um, but they want to go and see the elephants and spend two days in the forest. Yeah. <laughs> most, most, uh, I mean, most travellers to Bali, the important thing is what they do at night time from a mosquito point of view um, or a malaria point of view. So most, um, even though they do some adventurous things during the day, they often come back at night, which... Um, mm in their air-conditioned hotel, which cuts down the risk of the nighttime mosquito bites and therefore their malaria risk. So mm -hmm. Bali certainly, you know, is one of those places where there's no risk of malaria currently. And um, some of the, uh, even malaria, I guess other countries and other destinations with malaria around, but the, it's, it's the crucial daytime trips that can reduce your risk uh, at the same time. Um, I guess the things that um, I guess white water rafting can put you into contact with um, uh, leptospirosis, yep. sometimes schistosomiasis in certain areas. Um, people like to go, uh, not so much Bali, but I guess some of the other activity based illnesses are yeah. caving, is a big one, yeah. and they can quite often come across bats themselves, which yeah. Um, can scratch and bite and can pass on. There's a risk of Lyssa virus, so the, the rabies kind of crossover comes in there. Um, and the bat poo itself has actually got um, histo histoplasmosis in it. And there's yeah. been quite, there's a good case series presented recently at the International Conference about, um, about a series of histoplasma cases. Mm -hmm. So, and th they were all came, they all went to one cave in, uh, I think it was Honduras, yeah. um, and there was about 20 cases. So the activities that they're doing, it doesn't really matter which country, it's the activities that are important and the accommodation at night. So we, we kind of always go into a lot of detail about, about that. Mm -hmm. Typhoid vaccination is something that's frequently recommended by yeah. our computer program. Yeah. Is that something that, that you recommend particularly? Look, it's often used, um, I guess hepatitis A, the easy ones would be hepatitis A, we, we pretty much recommend across the board. Yep. Um, and mainly because it's highly infectious, untreatable, and you've got a risk, public health risk when you come back. Um, typhoid fever is um, very different really. The risk is probably much less. Um, it's probably higher through Southeast Asia and I suppose the reason it's, but the significance is, is much higher than hepatitis A, so it's still got a mortality attached, a, a higher mortality, it's uh, more of an issue for young kids and older adults. Yeah. And because of the ease of giving the vaccine combined with hep A, it's often given together. And we do sometimes look at itineraries and suggest that it's so short, the, accom the accommodation's excellent, the food and water looks absolutely, you know, amazing. 
the risk of typhoid in those circumstances, even Hep A probably is very low. So sometimes we just give Hep A, but I think the safe thing to do is to cover both mm -hmm. and use yeah. the combination vaccine. Now, there used to be an oral typhoid vaccine. Has that disappeared? Yeah. No, it's still around. We do use it from time to time. Needlephobics. Um, it's useful for them. It does actually, it's, it's covering a slightly different range of bugs. It has... Um, it has some advantages in that it covers uh, paratyphoid, mm -hmm. uh, more the typhoid VI needle vaccine doesn't only covers typhoid fever, not paratyphoid. So there is some advantage there, and it does. If you have four tablets um, or four capsules given, um, um, it can last five years rather than three. So there's some sort of longer duration. The problem is in GP um, in the country. Um, typhoid capsules come as a box, mm -hmm. and a box of three, and the three tablets just last uh, three years, yeah. and you have to split another box to get an extra couple of years, and yeah. it's not that useful. We keep it here on the shelf, so it's a bit easier for us. Um, but the main reason we don't use typhoid oral vaccine, uh, we probably use it much less, is is uh, people forget halfway through the course, much like taking an antibiotic, they kind of remember the first two mm -hmm. and then the other two get left in the car or uh, in the cupboard and then they go off and they, they're back to square one again. So that's why. And you mentioned other noxious things like lysivirus. Somebody got really ill while they were on their adventure holiday. Mm. What would you recommend they did? Well, I guess we're always... Um, the commonest things, obviously, are, are gastro and uh, respiratory illness. I'd always suggest that they have some simple medications with them to treat those basic things. Mm -hmm. And um, so, um, some low pyramide. What else would you yeah, put look, in? Yeah, um, rehydration salts. Lepiramide is useful. Um, um, Stematol Maxilon can be very good. Yeah. Um, and. You can, the, the first line antibiotics, we, we use a combination of a stopper and a treater. There's yeah. good evidence that that's effective. And the choice of antibiotics are um, norfloxacin, probably mm -hmm. we've used over the years. But more recently, um, there's increase in drug resistance against the quinolones. And we're using az azithromycin as probably first line for, especially Southeast Asia, yeah. for gastro. So you can cover those basic illnesses pretty well. And when you're prescribing azithromycin, do yeah. you give them like two tablets, three tablets? Sorry, it's one tablet a day for three days, yep. so 500 milligrams, yeah. Um, and over and above that, so really fever when they're travelling, I suppose that's the crucial one. Yeah. Um, depends where they've been and what they're doing, but malaria is always top of our list for looking out for. Um, although you know, for short trips, it's usually when they've come back. Um, dengue fever is probably what we've seen most of this year, and I'm sure that's yeah. been seen in the country as well. Um, but, you know, really, I guess they're the main issues to look out for, and if you can't treat simple things you, yourself, you have to then see medics overseas. Mm -hmm. For Bali, I mean, most of us see patients going to Bali. There is a very, there are different medical centres in Bali itself, but there is a very good one in Dempsar near the airport and it's Australian, it's kind of an Australian run um, clinic there called Bali International Medical Centre. So that's very good for telling your young families and things if their kids get sick, they've got, you know, places Somebody where they'll speak English, English and, mm. you know, it looks like you're going to surgery here. So it's, it's quite good for them. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of other things that you advise the patients to pack, Apart from medications, what do you tell them yeah. to always take with them? And their rehydration salts? Yeah, I mean, basic gastro things, but beyond that, um, you know, good repellents, tropical strength uh, DEET is the recommended uh, product there for mosquito avoidance. Um, That's the 40%? Thir about 30% thir is what the Something. data yep. says, yeah. Mm -hmm. So most of your, in practical terms, tropical strength, it has to be tropical strength. Um, most of the brands are pretty good. They're sort of twenty-five percent plus, mm -hmm. um, and that would be that would be fine, really. Um, and what else? Alcohol hand gels, really good. 
Yeah. Um, especially for cruise ships. They, I think they dish them out fairly readily on cruises anyway, but they're very good for cutting down your gastro risk. And paracetamol, antihistamines, always good to have in your bag. What about things like the um, permethrin mosquito repellent mm. that we used to soak the nets in the clothes mm. and for longer holidays? Do people still use that? Yeah, still do. The bed nets are all pre-soaked in that these days, or ones that you'd buy here in Australia would mm. always be pre-soaked. Um, and even in camping shops and things in the city, I guess, you, you can buy trekking clothes and things that are already pre-soaked. So permethrin is a very good barrier uh, over and above the clothing. You can do it yourself. Um, I don't know about access to that in, in country areas, but Bunnings sells permethrin, so you mm. can do it. Um, that's very useful. Um, vitamin B1, for some people, uh, on that mosquito risk, vitamin B1, there's some evidence that it reduces a reaction to bite, so that's a useful thing for it. There's always one in the room, in the family, that's mm -hmm. loved by mosquitoes, so that's always a useful addition. What things like ticks, fleas, bed bugs. Yeah, look, I think a lot of that comes down to common sense. Not, none of the products really work very well for that. Permethrin probably has some benefits for um, uh, some of those vectors, but really it's... Uh, I, the tick one's an interesting one. We, we quite often see cases of tick typhus for, from southern Africa. Mm -hmm. having done walking safaris and things so we often uh, just suggest if they're doing walking safaris just to have a look for ticks after they've been on a walk and you know safe removing um, but they're pretty common here in the country as well so I guess yeah, you know, yeah. bed bugs well bed nets bed bugs are a very big problem globally for travel in, yeah. especially in budget travel so it's a very big problem and uh, there's a lot of drug resistance again you know for the topical treatments that they use mm -hmm. um, and uh, bed nets I guess are the, the ideal thing to carry if you're not sure if you're going to have you know sealed accommodation bed nets are really useful to carry with you and they'll protect you against other biting bites as well as mosquitoes mm -hmm. so you tuck it in under the mattress and yeah the bed bugs can't climb yeah, through it that's right yeah got any really good tips for removing ticks uh, well, there's various ways, but I, I think, I mean, I think the accepted way now is good forceps, grab the head, twist and pull. Mm -hmm. I think that's the yeah. recommended I've way. I've got a lovely little plastic veterinary gadget that costs about five dollars that um, just lifts and twists. Yeah, um, yeah. I think the days of burning and such yeah, like burning and putting toothpaste on them or oil on yeah. them or whatever. Yeah, not so good. What about the uh, the other kind of general advice that you give to your your patients who yeah. are going off DVTs and alcohol and contraception and yeah, I mean there is a lot to cover. I mean we we kind of tend to focus on vaccines, but really the I, I guess the focus of the consultation is really trying to trying to pass on that education and and it, it's really good at the end if if end of the consultation if possible just to take a step back from the vaccines and such and look at the general context. So. But it depends very much on age and activities again. So, you know, um, uh, I guess we cover all sorts of things like that in the time given. So, A lot but, of the patients ask about the DVT stockings and whether or not yeah. they can wear their TED stockings on the plane. Yeah. Do the socks and stockings work? I think the most important one on that is, is just being reasonably active, hydration. Um, the evidence for, there is evidence for stockings uh, being beneficial but it's not it's not wonderful evidence but there is evidence that it helps um, TEDs probably aren't recommended as far as I gather is because they go above the knee so the recommendation for travel is below knee mm -hmm. um, and I guess you're trying to pick out the higher risk patients there as well so family history past history contraceptive pill smoking um, are all sort of risk factors. And, yeah. and, and Patients who've had past DVTs or yeah. who are in those very high risk groups with a positive thrombophilia screen mm. often advise to carry Clexane with them. Mm. Um, how do you go carrying syringes full of stuff mm. onto aeroplanes? Yeah, it's pretty complicated. I mean, I gather that there's... Um, well, th that might be about to change. Um, 
the current recommendations are if you're at significant risk, then if you're flying for over five hours, you should consider uh, Klexin. Um, and Klexin is good in that it's 24 hour cover, so it's, uh, it, it's relatively easy, but you can, you can inject about an hour or two before you fly, so you can actually leave the needle syringes at home. It's fine until you've got to fly back again. <laughs> yeah, well, you've got to carry them with you. You need a letter, obviously, to carry it through and the purpose for it. Um, the airports, are, I'm fairly certain that the airports have needle disposal units, mm -hmm. pretty much, you know, through the, most yeah. airports now. So you can safely dispose of them. You have to do it before you get on the plane, obviously. And there are risks attached to using it, so it's very important to get the risk-benefit correct. There is a... Um, there's a newer um, oral um, anticoagulant released recently on the PBS for use. F it's got it's um, indicated for uh, um, treatment and prevention of uh, venous thrombosis and PEs. It hasn't got an indication on the PBS for DVT prophylaxis for travel, and it may never have. PBS yeah. cover for that, but I think the evidence is uh, there. Is, there are some. These know, are the new warfarin, yeah, warfarin substitute right. things that are irreversible. Yeah. So yeah, that's right. But I have had a couple of patients recently that had been given them by the, their haematologist mm -hmm. to take prior to travel, and that then gets away from the needles and syringe issue, which is a major yeah. advantage. But there are caveats in that as well. Yeah. In terms of documentation, mm. would most airlines or airports accept a doctor's letter on letterhead? Yeah, I, I don't hear many stories about people being having problems with uh, carrying medications through, for example. Do you mean needles or medication well, or just generally? I'm general? thinking either, yeah. Either. Don't hear too many reports these days about people running into problems with medications when they've got a letter. So I think the covering letter is really useful, and mm -hmm. I think that would get people through without too much trouble. I think um, obviously they they need to keep uh, they need enough medication to carry them through the trip, yeah. and they need whatever they're going to use on board. So most of it they can probably pack in the hold, and no one generally don't appear to check most of the time um, but they obviously need their own personal medications on the, on the plane mm -hmm. I think covering letter seems to work you know yeah. I've recently taken a fair bit of medication overseas and I had it mm. packed just for the time I was overseas mm. in a Webster pack and mm. um, that seemed to be perfectly acceptable yeah, to the airport. I don't think they're too worried these days it's so common. David having recently been the doctor doing the travel mm. and I guess doctors do travel with their their families and with mm. groups yeah when you are the medical professional um you know what extra things might you be called on mm. to deal with it's very difficult but the I mean the potential is there for all sorts of eventualities isn't it mm. I would um I think probably the most important thing is um is knowing the contacts on the ground in the place that you're staying. So, one of the first things I'd, I'd either uh, I'd either speak to the groups that have been before and try and uh, find medical contacts on the ground, and make make contact with them probably before you go, so you have so you know what's there and mm -hmm. what's relevant, um, and where to turn to in, in the case of, if you needed help. Um, I mean, it is a very unusual situation in that in that you're out with your normal comfort, so it's, it can be it can be very stressful. I guess um, having your own, I guess people will come to you and they'll expect you to have certain medications and things. So I'd always have a you know an adequate first aid kit, um, probably some needle and syringes and various blood taking equipment and things like that. Um, and and good first aid, um, but I think the uh, I think most of it um, uh, I guess a, a lot of it depends on the local contacts there. Yeah. I suppose the acute emergency issues as well. You I guess you would have to have think about through the common scenarios for emergency care as well. 
again, as you say, depending on what Depends you're about to do. What age group you're talking about, where yeah. you're going, what the backup is, yeah, I think yep. so. If you are kind of in that situation and you confronted with something that's a little bit out of your comfort mm. zone, for many doctors in Australia that could be something like dengue. Mm. How do you treat dengue until you get it to, to somewhere that's got a bit more facility than you have? Um, yeah, look, dengue's, dengue in itself is, I mean, I guess if we're talking about an adult age group here or uh, late teenagers, um, the treatment is symptomatic, so it's really yeah. hydration, paracetamol and observation, really. Mm -hmm. But probably the most important thing is knowing um, uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever can happen, but it's, it, it would be probably unusual in the first case. Mm -hmm. um, the most important thing is to make sure it's not something else. Um, yeah. So you kind of always got to, um, you know, use that local medical backup. Um, the other issue with dengue, mo most of us on a trip like that would be, it would be a short trip, so it yeah. might be a week or two. Mm -hmm. Um, and the GP may well be confronted with it back in Australia and think, oh, I wonder yeah, what well, this is. Yeah, dealing with it here is, uh, you know, is symptomatic care and you can make a positive diagnosis on, on arrival but you have to make sure it's not malaria or some, something else that's presenting mm -hmm. with fever but, um, you know, dengue is very common. Yeah. Uh, now I have heard that when the second time you get dengue you're much more, much more significantly yeah, ill or that you're going that. to die. Yeah, look, uh, there what is a, there? The, the facts are it's about a 10% increased chance of dengue hemorrhagic fever if you get it at a subsequent time. Mm -hmm. It does depend on the strain type, so there's four strains and it does depend on which strain you're getting. But we often don't know that and it's a clinical diagnosis essentially. Uh, probably the most important test for the GP to do if they're suspecting dengue is, um, is hematocrit. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Dengue hemorrhagic fever is, uh, it doesn't always happen on subsequent uh, bouts of dengue. But just much more, more likely. Just more likely, yeah. And we'll hold that discussion there for just a moment. More and more people seem to be shipping overseas for elective cosmetic surgery. While the cost can be significantly less, it can come at a different price and many consumers seem to have unrealistic expectations about the significance of the procedures undertaken, the risks involved and the rate of recovery. We spoke with plastic and reconstructive surgeon Dr Mark Strawn about this trend and the problems that can arise. Mark, welcome to the programme. Thank you, Olga. Thanks for inviting me along. Mike, there seem to be lots of advertisements and articles about patients taking a holiday mm. and having some cosmetic surgery while they're doing that. Um, and so I've seen things like get your breast implants done in Thailand or your facelift done in Singapore. Sure, sure. Yeah. And then I've recently been to Europe and discovered that um, the Danes and the Swedes go to Germany because it's cheaper and the French seem to go to Israel because it's cheaper. Cheaper again, yeah. Um, it's, I guess it's happening all over the place. Well, I think it is. I think it's a worldwide phenomenon and it's well documented. There's many conferences and books being issued on medical tourism and, in fact, yeah. surgical tourism. And what's happening from Australia, particularly in Western Australia, is a lot of people are heading north to Asia, particularly to Thailand, to consider having their, their procedures done. Um, we're finding it within our society of plastic surgeons quite a problem. A number of people are coming back with less than less than satisfactory outcomes. Some people are coming back quite ill, quite infected, mm. and needing follow-up surgery and operations. In fact, some of those are coming back quite quite ill and need life-saving interventions. Yeah. So, what sorts of disasters have you had to well, rescue? Well, a number of disasters have come through, but I think first we need to look at the numbers of what's happening. It's hard to record because people aren't volunteering what they're going away for and we're not sure about the success stories that come through and are doing well, but certainly through the Australian Society of Plastic Surgeons, there's up to about 3,000 people a year heading overseas and getting something done surgically. Mm -hmm. Now of those, around about, on broad figures, about 30% are not happy with the outcome, with the final result, and are either seeking immediate surgery to correct a problem or long-term surgery. So across Australia, about a thousand people are returning with a problem. That's either an acute problem with an infection 
or a longer term problem. Or just an unsatisfactory result. Or just an unsatisfactory result, you know, didn't get what they wanted for basically. So as a GP, I guess our patients don't always come and discuss this with us. No, no they don't. Right. But if they do decide to go on this type of holiday, what sort of right. advice would you <laughs> be giving well, them? Well, ultimately, they're getting what they pay for. So a, a breast augmentation performed in Thailand will cost somewhere with the whole package um, on our research, somewhere between five to seven thousand yeah. dollars. Now that's probably a half or a third of what you'd pay in Australia. Now patients are very, uh, a cohort of patients are very price sensitive, you know, uh, uh, younger women. Um, earning decent money for the first time and thinking about these uh, forms of self-improvement mm -hmm. and so are heading away but we would counsel both our colleagues GPs and patients just to be very aware of what you're getting yourself into you know holidays are holidays and surgery is surgery mm. and we feel that the two shouldn't be mixed together at all at all um, the concerns we have are the market's not as regulated or as reliable as it is, say, in Australia or New Zealand. The, the training of the surgeons, while they well, well may be internationally recognised, the procedures they're performing are uh, designed for high turnover, for high volumes, to get as many patients done in a week as possible. Mm -hmm. And so analysis of the cases and the reports that come through is that the procedures are not um, not tailored individually for each patient, mm -hmm. but are designed more of on a production line method. Yeah. Now, Mark, just before the program, you were yeah. talking to me about um, the method that's used for breast implant sure. insertion. Sure. Could you just go through that for sure. us? Sure. I'll provide you with some pictures we can look at later as well. Um, every patient needs to be assessed on their own merit. The size, let's talk about breast reduction, breast augmentation, the size of their breast, the position of the, of the breasts on their chest and what implants are best suited. Now, it's well known for many years that high complication rates, capsular contracture, extrusion of implants, deformation and rimpling occur if simple implants are used, simple being smooth, round and inserted from an auxiliary approach. Mm -hmm. Now. Um, so that technique of most surgeons in Australia have moved away from. Now we're performing inframammary with textured surface anatomically shaped implants that are partially hidden underneath the pectoral muscle. So there's much lower rates of capsular contracture, of implant extrusion and, and asymmetries through that approach. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately overseas because of the time constraints and probably the lower level of training, most are being applied through the armpit, smooth and round, mm -hmm. and they're getting high rates of problems, high rates of problems. You were talking about not mixing the holiday with the surgery, and I know yep. some of the patients will say that they're expecting to kind of have their surgery and then spend time oh, look, lounging by, or by the pool with a yep. cocktail. Yep. Um, the couple of patients that I've counselled about this, I've kind of freaked and said, do not under any circumstances get in the pool. Oh look, certainly. <laughs> Uh, following an operation you need to rest and you need to rest properly either in a hospital or at home and I think the temptation of being back at the villa in the poolside is probably too great. You mix in alcohol, you mix in some fun and parties and getting into the water um, with fresh wounds I think it's a crazy combination. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the standard of care provided in Australia is going to be much greater and much more reliable than being overseas and then there's the issue of travelling as well. You're getting back on an aeroplane, you've had a general anaesthetic you're carrying luggage around and it's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some of the patients say, oh, well, I can always get some antibiotics over the counter in Thailand. Sure. Um, one of the things that my research has revealed is that many medications uh, sold over the counter don't actually contain mm. what they say mm. they contain. Mm. Um, some papers up to 40 per cent. What's your experience yep. with overseas yep. medication? Yep. I spoke to the, um, the microbiology and infectious disease team at Fremantle about that and they agree that as well as the hospital systems are less regulated, so are their pharmaceutical industries. And if you're feeling something unwell or, or you think an infection's starting, utilising the local product is not guaranteed to, uh, to be beneficial mm. at all. Yep. Yeah as well as all the antibiotic resistance that they have with... Uh, well true, different countries, breed, different countries breed different bugs and you'd need to have early intervention if something were wrong. 
So I think when patients, if, when they come back to Australia, having been overseas and everything's gone all right, and then if they do present to one of our colleagues in a bit of trouble, well then early action needs to be taken. Yep. We need to get fresh swabs, as much sample material as you can get, pus is good, tissue specimens are good, keep them preserved and then start some heavy duty flu cloxacillin would be the first step for mm. that. Review of the patient. country doctors, we can often put the patient into hospital. True, I think IV. admission IV, QID two grams would be the way to go. And then probably immediate contact with either a plastic surgeon here in Perth or through the infectious diseases department at a major hospital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they'd be prepared for that. Yeah. Now, when something has gone monumentally wrong and the True. patient comes back to, to us as the GP, um, how soon can they have something done to revise it? And can they have any kind of revision surgery done in the public system? Yeah, yeah it gets quite uh, convoluted and tangled, all these, all these scenarios. Not many people will have terrible things going wrong. Yeah. You know, one or two per hundred may get severe infection setting in. So they need immediate hospital care. In the case of a breast augmentation, the implants need to be removed. The pocket where the implant was will need to be washed out and packed more than once, I would say an extended stay in hospital on heavy duty antibiotics. They may even go home with a pick line, an ongoing supply of antibiotics to clear the infection. That wound bed then has to settle down for a number of weeks, if not months, mm -hmm. before any revisionary surgery and particularly before any further implant materials put in. Yeah. Public hospitals will not replace implants. Public hospitals will remove infected implants, but there's no funding within the public system to then re-augment uh, um, someone who's had breast augmentation done. Unless they've had a cancer in the breast yeah, place. Uh, augmentations are only used for breast reconstruction within mm -hmm. the public system. Yeah, yeah. So then the patient will be, if they wish to proceed, they need to then chase a, a private um, surgeon. They can either use their own funding and also out-of-pocket funding they need to provide. But they'd be facing more than one operation to make up for the for the injury that happened before. Yeah. yeah. Are there any procedures that you think are sufficiently low risk that maybe the, would be okay for the patients to go across and do? Call me ultra conservative, <laughs> but I wouldn't have a tattoo done in Bali, let alone any further surgery. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are certain places in the world that are good fun to visit for a holiday, and other places where you get your surgery done. Um, Anything that, any procedure that's introducing a foreign body into the body, such as an implant or mesh or any dental work or any orthopedic work, any procedure that requires a general anaesthetic, you know, where you're relying on another human and a machine to do the breathing for you, I think I'd rather do it in the safety of my own country. So no, it's nothing I'd recommend overseas. Fantastic. Well, Mark, thanks very much for joining us today. Perfect, thank you. And our thanks to Dr Mark Strawn for his time. And it's worth noting that Mark concentrates his time on reconstructive procedures and doesn't himself take referrals for the types of cosmetic procedures discussed. Well, now let's get back to our discussion with Dr Olga Ward and travel medicine specialist Dr David Rutherford. David, the patients do sometimes pop up with odd questions that are a bit difficult for the GP to answer. One of my patients came in and asked me whether or not water purification tablets actually mm. work. Are not they sure. effective? Yeah, look, there are, there are different varieties, there are different brands. Um, they're all based on certain things. They are, uh, most common ones are iodine or chlorine based t uh, tablets. The f facts are that if the water is clear, so it's not cloudy, and you use the um, iodine or chlorine based tablets for a certain amount, the, the kind of recommended time, I think it's an hour standing in, uh, with a certain concentration, mm -hmm. then they will kill off um, uh, most of the bugs, but they're not very good at killing off um, some of the cryptosporidium and some of the more mm -hmm. unusual organisms. Um, the best combination, I, I suppose the safest thing usually, or the most practical issue is bottled water is usually accessible and just check the seal and the label um, to make sure they haven't been tampered with. I, for most short holiday trips, I, I wouldn't go to the lens of purification tablets, to be honest, most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, 
if you wanted to, if you're going on longer trips and treks let's say you're going to Himalayas or trekking through those areas then the best thing is to um, um, use um, a combination of filters and uh, purification tablets mm -hmm. the one the purification tablets we tend to use is a calcium based one uh, called Markapur that seems to be very effective um, and the main thing is it doesn't taste as bad as the, um, it tastes better, so you can actually drink it. So the chlorine and iodine ones, mm -hmm. they're very hard to, to drink all yeah. the time. Yeah. Does boiling k kill enough Yeah, boiling is very good, yeah. yeah so boiling, exactly. uh, if, you, if you have access to boiling water and, and you boil it for, um, I'm pretty sure it's five minutes or longer, Mm -hmm. then it'll kill off all the bugs so that's including crypto and such like mm -hmm. so it's very it's the bit it's the gold standard but it's just not practical for short family trips and boiling the kettle isn't long enough ah, so you've mm. got to boil it several yeah. times yeah. to to keep so it at that if, rolling if, if you're boil. not sure about you know if you're having a cup of tea you could get some bottle you know use bottled water to fill the kettle and then boil it and then you're okay mm -hmm. one thing that occurs for gps David, is uh, that there aren't very many yellow fever vaccination centres and that some countries need a certificate. Mm. Yeah. And I really probably wouldn't know yellow fever if mm. it sucked me in the face. Mm. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the disease patterns and what's yeah, happening with sure. yellow fever? Yeah, look, there's been a lot of changes with yellow fever. It's, the illness hasn't changed. Um, it's still very much in Amazon, South America. And... Um, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, but the vaccine itself, there's been some changes with the vaccine or the prescribing of it, um, and the major changes have been in the last five years, maybe a little bit longer, there's been a few def definite recognised cases of vaccine-related side effects, and to the point where, um, I guess we break that down into two, two sides, um, viscerotropic and neurotropic side effects and they so they can affect the nervous system and the and the liver mm -hmm. um, they are very rare but they they are recognized and we've we've had some cases ourselves where people have developed these uh, rare side effects thankfully they've come good you know they've settled down and gone away um, but we're very careful who we prescribe the vaccine to these days um, it's made a bit more, I guess the people that are higher risk are those who um, are over age 60. Mm -hmm. um, and increasingly that's who we're seeing traveling. So it's a very difficult crossover. Um, the other, comp what we also um, um, battle with, I guess, is the, the vaccine is, it's trying to match First of all, we have to look at whether there's actually a risk to their health of the illness. And that's not always the case. So sometimes they're actually asked for a certificate of yellow fever when they're not actually going to be at any risk. And that's when it becomes really difficult in that yeah. you're giving potentially given a vaccine with the recognized side effects, side effects for, with when there's no health risk whatsoever. And that's purely for customs. And when that is the case, and we're very comfortable they don't have a health risk where we we do our best to find a way through you know with we find a way of providing a waiver to get them through customs if we can yeah and we, tr we try and find a medical contraindication for that but age is actually a medical contraindication these days so over 60, 65, which isn't that old really. No, and those are the people that have vaccine side effects or those are the people that need the vaccine? Um, if, they're, if they're going to an area that's at risk and they're medically well, we would generally give the vaccine. Yeah. But if, they're, if they need the vaccine purely for um, customs reasons yeah. and they're not at any risk, then we would tend to lean more towards a waiver. Mm -hmm. for that age group yeah yeah I hear that there's also an effective cholera vaccine these days yeah look um, remembering being yeah. extremely ill from one in the yeah, early 1970s yeah that's right it used to be uh, typhoid and cholera it used to be shocking yeah. vaccines I gather I, um, um, thankfully it's changed cholera vaccines now a drink rather than a needle yeah um, 
color of the illness, having said that, is very rare in travelers. So unless you're a humanitarian worker or you know, un very difficult water sourcing, it's very unlikely you're going to get cut true color. Um, but the vaccine does, we use a reasonable amount of time for those that are more risk of diarrhea. Um, so it covers E. coli very well. Yeah. Um, and cuts your risk down of gastro by about a third, uh, according to the study. So du Ducurol is the name of the vaccine, the brand, and it's two doses um, mixed together before you travel, so given a week or two apart. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really good for um, people, the people that are higher risk are, uh, you know, those with inflammatory bowel, um, people on uh, PPI, proton pump inhibitors with less acid seems to put their risk up of gastro. Yeah. Um, and anyone that seems to, you know, whenever they travel, there's always seems to be some travelers that just every time they go traveling, they get gastro. So we, you know, it's useful for them. David, with vaccines, the patients often show up four days before they're yeah, going to take off. Problem, Is yeah. there anything that's, uh, that's actually anything effective useful? if you give them four days before they take off? Yes, it is reality, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you mostly always would need a month or so. Bring it on you? you when you don't have much time mm. either. Yeah, look, hepatitis A works really quickly, so that's always worth giving. It covers you, they reckon, 24 hours you've got yep. nearly full cover, so I'd always give hep A. Um, typhoid takes a week to 10 days to give you full cover, so if it's last minute, there's probably not much value in giving typhoid, but it depends a little bit on the risk at the other end. Um, I, you know, really, all the other vaccines take a while to give you cover. Um, if you don't think you'll see them again for another 10 years, you can, tetanus is always a useful thing to, to give them on a parting gift. Um, but uh, really all the other vaccines, they just take too long. So if they're not that prepared, you just can't, you can't yeah. do your job properly. Okay. Really. So a um, recommended time frame? Oh, look, four weeks, ideally. And then the, the main one, that, the, the ones that take the time are Hepatitis B, if they haven't had it before. Yeah. Um, but also uh, rabies, Japanese encephalitis, they need three, four weeks. Um, and occasionally we need, to, you know, if they need malaria medications, then sometimes it's good to have time to trial certain medications. So that three, four weeks is really useful for that. Mm. David, when our patients come to see us about travel, apart from their vaccinations, quite often they've got a chronic illness that's going to need ongoing treatment while mm. they're overseas or mm. even travelling around Australia. Mm. What sort of paperwork do they need? Um, I suppose there's two sides to that. The paperwork, um, definitely a, a, a summary letter um, from a GP or the person that best knows, the doctor that best knows the patient, that'd be really useful. Um, maybe a recent summary letter from a specialist um, and uh, I guess um, the um, the other I guess aside from paperwork the, the main main issue is to try and stable I guess it's stabilize chronic issues before they go as well so mm. they sort of minimize um, uh, problems when they're away um, I guess the common ones are Warfarin, as we've talked about, warfarin yeah. and monitoring that, that's, that can be um, very difficult in um, certain parts of the world. Yeah. I know there are, there are little machines you can carry and do it yourself these days, I, yeah. I gather, but I haven't used one. That haven't. might well be worth the, the patient purchasing rather than yeah. trying to, to yeah. pay private doctors. Yeah, can right. you write a blood test form in Australia that's valid anywhere else? No, not as far as I'm aware. And what about prescriptions? Yeah, I mean prescriptions only work here as well. So you kind of either you um, you either take the right length of medications with you, so uh, and package that. As we're all aware, you can write reg reg regulation twenty four, and they can take out six months um, prescriptions without too many troubles. But it's mm -hmm. carrying them. They certainly need the a letter covering letter, and ideally probably with a generic. Um, name rather than the brand name so if they are overseas then they can uh, they can find a you know have an updated script without too much trouble yeah um 
other things that the patients run into are problems like if they're taking insulin with mm. them. I guess not so much of a problem now that we've got nice stable insulins mm. in pens. Mm. Um, but I've got a number of rheumatology patients with fancy MABs in syringes that mm. need refrigerating. Yeah. Um, how do you organise to refrigerate those in mm. your hand baggage? Do they mm. have to be, um, like, should, should the doctor ring the airline first or mm. how does it all work? Just write a letter. That's a very good question. Um, we sometimes have people flying uh, if they're going and I suppose the same thing applies to vaccines. Occasionally we have to pack vaccines in little yep. esky containers so they can carry those, but it's only useful for short flights. Mm -hmm. Really, I, I don't know. Um, I guess so they would have to organise it. with a chili brick and seal it. Yeah, but you know, k properly packed and all that. But mm -hmm. um, I guess if they had to have it refrigerated for a long haul flight, they would really have to contact the airline and you know make sure they could they could um, organise that for them mm -hmm. during flights. Is that the that's the um, TNF inhibitors and yes. things? Is it? I can't say I've seen a patient that had to carry one overseas, mm -hmm. um, but it's only a matter of time before I do. Um, those patients in themselves are a, a big, um, you know, much higher risk than many, maybe they realise themselves, I think, the TNF inhibitor. Mm -hmm. um, there's people, uh, there's numerous cases of people developing quite obscure infections overseas being on some of these uh, immune modulators, so that they are a risk into themselves, mm -hmm. um, you know, drugs aside. So these would be patients that you would consider vaccinating more comprehensively Definitely. than you might Definitely. otherwise. The other, the other problem being that the vaccines don't always, when they're on the, those medications, the vaccines aren't as effective mm -hmm. as when they're not. So, yeah. What about the patients so on difficult. steroids? Yeah, they're, um, they're equally as... Uh, I think the vaccines will work, it depends on which dose of steroids that they're on, but um, mm -hmm. the vaccines generally are quite protective. Um, but I'd always, don't, don't forget the uh, flu vaccine, pneumonia vaccine, I'd definitely mm -hmm. always use if, if they've got um, immune suppression. Um, obviously the yellow fever issues along with those, it's another complication with yellow fever vaccine. Um, but they are higher risk for um, uh, especially uh, encapsulated illnesses, so pneumococcus, malaria. Um, Not serious. They're, yeah, they're very high risk for those illnesses, so definitely vaccinate when you can. Mm. And I, I have advised patients to change their itinerary because of the risk and the benefit. So because, of their, because they're immunosuppressed, mm -hmm. Um, if you can't give them, let's say you can't give them yellow fever vaccine yep. for a safety issue, but they are at a significant risk of the illness, then I would recommend that they didn't go to that particular area. Mm -hmm. uh, malaria is another one, so um, uh, if they're going to high risk malaria area and they're immunosuppressed, then make it very clear to them yeah. that's probably going against our advice. And, uh, and pregnancy and malaria is another one, a uh, common one, where we advise them to go to a non-malarial area because of the risk of malaria and pregnancy and to the mum and to the, child, uh, the unborn child. Yeah. In terms of patients who are immune suppressed, do they respond to illnesses like malaria any differently? Yeah, they're much more, potentially much more severe. Uh -huh. They get much so quicker. they will get a, a really rapid onset, yeah. rather than yeah, just sort of having, much quicker. Yeah. having less symptoms or symptoms that you don't see quite so easily. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, they're high risk patients. Mm. You mentioned pregnant patients. Yeah. Is there any other advice that you give to your pregnant patients, quite apart from uh, avoiding high risk um, infection areas? I suppose the other things that are relevant for pregnancy DVTs higher risk. Um, um, there's a very much a limit to what vaccinations you can use in pregnancy. Or we, we try and not give any vaccines in pregnancy, but there are some that the risk benefits in favour. I think the current health department guidelines suggest that anyone that, that's pregnant should have influenza vaccine. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's particularly important for travel. I think it's often overlooked for travel influenza, so that's a, always a good thing to remember.
Um, obviously, the same food and water hygiene is, you know, as you would be careful here, you have to be ultra careful in the destinations from listeria and other things. Um, so recently boiled and recently boiled for five yeah, minutes I mean, I, I, and peeled by yourself. I mean, all those, you know, traditional. I, I always advise um, travellers to eat, uh, you know, hot, freshly Piping boiled hot. rice mm -hmm. and vegetarian diet when they're travelling. That's probably the lowest risk mm -hmm. um, way of eating when you travel. You don't find that they come back then with bacillary dysentery from the rice? <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> Unfortunately, the studies all show that no matter how careful you are, it doesn't seem to help. Yeah. So if you start from there, but um, I still, um, your what? I guess the way that I describe it is um, through many years of saying saying things over and over. Um, bottled water, safest thing to do. Um, anything that's made from water and not cooked is a risk. So. Um, ice in your drinks, salads, fruit salads, it's the water they're rinsed in and the handling rather than so much the food. Mm -hmm. um, and then the safest things are hot vegetarian food. And boiled rice, if it's freshly boiled for five minutes then it's going to be safe. And vegetarian food's the lowest risk. And then um, if you add in um, meat dishes on top of that, the lowest risk is fresh chicken. Um, and then the risk goes up through beef, pork, uh, um, shellfish at the top of the, ri uh, at the, top of the list in terms yeah. of risk. Um, and fish very much depends on how fresh it is and, and if it's cooked thoroughly there and then. So I'd probably leave fish to the you know, freshly caught or best restaurants, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Sounds like very good advice. It's <laughs> what I do when I go. David, if things really go pear-shaped and you have a massive emergency, mm. um, what sort of advice do you give to the patients? Yeah, look, you, you've, you've really got to, if you travel overseas, you, you should, we, probably one of the most important things is to have travel insurance uh, with Medivac uh, cover, so you have to check that they've got that. And then on the policy, they'll have a contact number, international contact number, and they'll put you in touch with local medical care or they'll help you know get, provide you with mm -hmm. medical assistance yep. and if you need to call an ambulance say in Sri Lanka or Timbuktu mm. um, what do you do yeah the international emergency number um, wherever you are is 112 so always remember that yeah finally could you could you give us a, a one minute summary mm. of travel medicine for for GPs mm. who are advising patients okay well <laughs> I'll try. Um, in, a, in an ideal scenario, if, if you can, um, if you, uh, my, uh, probably the most important message is try not rush travel medicine because I think it's usually tagged on at the end of a consultation and people want an answer now and they want you to give the vaccine straight away. And I think, I think because of that reason, I think a lot of things are often, the education part of the travel medicine consults often over uh, overlooked. So if it's ever possible to say, look, that's really important, I'm glad you've told me that, but please come back tomorrow or in a couple of days and we'll just talk about travel, that would be my ideal advice. But assuming that that doesn't happen, um, I always think, I've got my, my little um, reminder is the three, I use the uh, the three R's. So one is required vaccines. So yellow fever is usually the one that is involved there and I just have to check the itinerary and whether it's required. And then the other ones are uh, routine vaccines. So it's a good chance to check they're up to date with what they should have routinely and that depends on their age. Um, and then uh, recommended vaccines uh, for the itinerary and that's not just, I think the important message is it's not um, the country they're going to so much as what what the activities they're doing and what their accommodations doing. They're equally as important as the countries. Obviously, there's web-based information and there are lists of country-specific vaccines, but really you have to look at the itinerary and the person to work it out, not just those 
Yeah. Less, so yeah. five star hotel in Nairobi yeah. might be a lower risk That's than right. uh, than a youth hostel in yeah, in the Ukraine. It changes yeah. everything. So you know that individual, each case by case is so different, um, and uh, you know malaria is still the most important illness probably uh, when it's relevant and uh, you know there are that is good there are good sources of information to find the best antimalarials we're currently using probably malarone and doxycycline the most i, I rarely prescribe mefloquine these days mm -hmm. um and always even though you're giving them good medications always warn them that they're not 100 percent. and if they have fever uh, either when they're away or on return especially when they're on return yeah. to let you know and think about malaria um I would, um, and I would, if there's time, I'd try and prescribe them some useful, you know, basic medications, including antibiotics to carry with them. So, so they antibiotics, anti-nausea, anti-diarrheals. Yeah, I think they're very important and they can happen, you know, it can happen in, anywhere really. And uh, it's just so um, uh, inconvenient and problematic to have to seek medical care in some, some parts of the world, so it's, it's a useful part of the consultation if you can. Mm. Great. David, thanks very much for joining us today. Okay. Thanks, Olga. And that's all we have time for in this programme. Remember, if you'd like to review this or any of our previous broadcasts, you can visit ruralhealthwest.com.au. We're back on the 5th of November with the programme focusing on sports medicine. I'm Jerry Gannon. Thanks for joining us.